My understanding is I've been asked to provide some new examples and ideas for integration. So I would like to, and I, I was uh, told to uh, address the themes of multi-scale territories, food legumes, uh, food processing, and other uh, ideas and examples of integration. Um, I'm coming from the perspectives of the environmental social sciences, geography, as well as the field of ecology. Uh, I'll be talking about coupled human natural systems, and I'll be describing, I'll be trying to be provocative, so I'm trying to uh, make new novel uh, contributions to the discussion. So when we think about territories, I'd say that a lot of the existing ideas of food territories come from basically models of uh, nested hierarchical spaces. So going from the space of a, of a plant to a, to a field, to maybe multiple fields, to a household, it could be a gendered household, the household is within a community, the community is within a village, the village is within a region, the region is within a country. And I'd say that those are our existing ideas about territoriality. And I, I, I support those ideas, I think those are very good ideas, but I'm gonna suggest that the reality of the world we live in is suggesting that we consider other new and actually quite different ideas. And here I'm gonna present just a couple of those. So the first one is to recognize that the nested hierarchical models do not take account of the movement of people through space. They basically assume that, that, that people are very restricted in their movements, and this is increasingly at odds with the reality of a world in which migration at multiple scales is a part of life. I'm not saying I agree with it or I disagree with it, but we all know that it's widespread, that the farmers that we work with often have highly diversified pluriactivity lifestyles that involve migration. So in being provocative, what I'm suggesting here is that we think of spaces of biodiversity and food that can basically be multi-site spaces and that they can, be, they can be discontiguous from each other. So you can have a community with people who migrate from that community and they could be tens of kilometers away or hundreds or thousands of kilometers away. And this is work that we started uh, about 10 years ago. I decided that being provocative was the best thing to do for biodiversity and food, and to work with uh, migration first was what I intended to do. And in this case study, we found that migration was positively associated with higher levels of biodiversity and food access, which is very counterintuitive. We all probably learned that traditional societies have less diversity when they disconnect, but in fact, Either way can be true, but to recognize that there can be higher diversity associated with pluriactivity opens up for us a lot of spaces to be thinking about diversity and food that otherwise would have been totally shut off if, if, if our assumptions were that migration spelled the end of the world for diversity. So what, what I'll get to next is basically what are the conditions under which you can have these discontiguous spaces. This is, a, these, this is survey data from a community in central Bolivia whose family members migrate, and basically the, the occurrence of migration is positively associated with higher levels of biodiversity and food access. So how does that actually work? So, the important thing, in my view, is to think about what are the conditional capacities? What's necessary for migration to be positive for biodiversity and for food? People need to continue to value 
that biodiversity, which was taking place in this case study, they need to have secure tenure to land and to water. Often these are community institutions. So this new view of territoriality is basically still recognizing the importance of local food territories. I think these are the ones that many of us think about when we consider food access, food, food sovereignty, food issues in general, while recognizing that there are often other spaces farther away that are taking place uh, in this process. And the key thing in this study was basically the role of remittances, money that was being sent back to the households, and that they were their investments included investing in diversity. So here you had a case where households with uh, members who migrated were more likely to have more diversity because they benefited from remittances while still valuing diversity, while still having secure resource tenure, while still having functional community institutions. And so these are kinds of positive, positive combinations that I provocatively want to suggest is our new forms of territoriality. So I was asked to talk about new territoriality and this is my first example. My second example is the role of urban spaces. And here, uh, my work started about five years ago in, with a group of urbanization scientists and also a project on farmer seed systems, what we call informal or local seed systems. There are great people here in Montpellier who do this kind of work other places. Um, the interesting assumption how it's always been that traditional or farmer seed systems are most common farther away from cities. Uh, in a recent work on an 11 country sample with uh, over 130 million users of these informal seed systems, we found that there's actually a tendency for informal seed to be most common closer to cities. And this is important. We live in an urbanized world. More than half the people in the world now live in cities. And so while we work with farmers, while we work in rural spaces, I'm sure all of us recognize that the influence and the interactions with urban spaces is increasingly influential. And rather than assuming that it's always negative to be provocative, what I've done for this talk is to think about what can be the positive influences of urbanization. Of course, many of us participate and contribute in these positive influences just by uh, doing our own personal food shopping with farmers markets or through uh, a, a living in urban spaces while supporting uh, farmers close to cities. We are, we're, we're, we live as positive um, influences of this type. In the case of the informal seed, which is really important, as we know, for, for food outcomes, whether all the way from food security to, to, to food sovereignty and, and everything in between, access to affordable, low-cost seed is what a lot of the world depends on. I'm sure many of you have seen this in, in your work. And so recognizing that these low-cost seed systems are actually most common closer to cities, I think, opens up a really lot of interesting space to think about how to consider food sovereignty and food issues. And um, we've also designed a, a conceptual model of this, um, again, with a, a group of economists and urbanization scientists thinking about what on the right are basically kind of key processes associated with urbanization influences on food systems and how, in fact, there's a wide range between producing outcomes that lead to very low levels of diversity, that can lead to a lack of food security or food sovereignty, or ones that can be more supportive. So uh, the provocative point that I mean to make is that these are not systems that have automatic outcomes. Migration 
and urbanization, things that we all experience in our everyday lives and have mostly assumed are negative for food systems, food sovereignty, biodiversity, can actually have positive outcomes associated with it. And I welcome the chance to en engage a group of people who work with farmers, who work with diversity, who work with food issues, to think about this new view of territoriality that I'm suggesting from the research that I've done over the past 10 years or so. So these are, uh, this is the first set of my talk. Um, again, uh, I, I, I talked about the multi-scale territories, but now I'm, I've also added the roles of migration and urbanization. And so in each section of the talk, it's late in the day, we're tired, we've been here since early in the morning, I'm gonna be as provocative as possible to like keep you on your toes and thinking, and hopefully I'll be, uh, uh, It'll be understandable, too. So the second thing that they asked me to talk about, excuse me, talk about is the role of food legumes. So when I was invited, they said, food territories, then food legumes. Very different. I was like, wow, what kind of talk covers food territories and food legumes? And then I thought, well, um, actually, a different project that I've been involved in for several years is designing a model of biodiversity and food, uh, integrating, that's the big theme here, integrating multiple knowledge systems. It's called the Agrobiodiversity Knowledge Framework. I've worked on it, I've worked on it with a, a lot of people and we've had a chance to apply it. And I could go on and on about this, I've written a book about this, I've written articles about this, but. I want to talk about it with regard to food legumes, introduce it, and, and, and really uh, make that the, the main point. I think for, for our purposes, it's the horizontal axis in this model that I really want to emphasize. So the, the farm characteristics, the agrobiodiversity and ecology, and the interactions with food and diet. And the point I'm going to make, and I'll use this to, few slides to do it, but I'm going to try to make just one simple point, is that food legumes are really interesting because they're bi-directional across that horizontal axis. They are both important for positive nutritional health and diet outcomes, and they are positive when they're in the diets in terms of, uh, of a better biodiversity outcomes. So that's what ecologists call a coupled system. Ecologists love coupled systems. It gives us a chance to think about synergies. And I think, I, I personally, I, I started my professional life with a master's thesis on food legumes. So I, <laughs> I, I just love food legumes. I'm really happy to loop back to this and, and to have a chance to, to talk about it. So let me advance the slides. I'm going to briefly describe the case study. So this is now a, I guess, seven or eight year case study. It's in central Peru, about 350 miles to the northeast of Lima. It's right on the, on the Amazon Andes ecotone. So the study areas go from about 1,200 to 4,500 meters above sea level. Enormous range of biodiversity, megadiversity center, more than 35 cultivated species, dozens and hundreds of varieties. Yes, this is where the 4,000 different types of potatoes in the world are located, but Andean maize, for example, is incredibly diverse. Cucurbits are incredible, multiple species, multiple varieties, and legumes are really diverse. And at the same time, um, these, 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 these people are, are living in this, uh, in, the, in this landscape of, um, of, you know, of being connected to the world. They're, they're far away from Lima, but they're, they're pretty connected. And so this is, a, this is our project, stakeholder inputs through focus groups, research teams. I work a lot with nutritionists, with people who bring in a nutrition and health perspective, and it involved work during the pandemic, which I'll get to in a minute, because that's a really interesting 
way of learning about these systems, too. So first set of findings are basically going from the left of the model, from the agrobiodiversity and farm characteristics to the nutrition and diet outcomes. And there, there are, in fact, several predictors and significant factors involving diversity that contribute to health and diets and nutrition that are positive and better than they, they would be otherwise. And food legumes are one of them. So, uh, you know, I, I think when they sent me the instructions for my talk, it said, like, from grains to legumes. Well, it is legumes that really, really matter in uh, this system. There are different species of Fasciolus. There's, um, there, there, there are peas. Tarwi is the, the Andean lupin. Uh, they're lentils, and so, so we have a, a various biodiversity predictors of better nutrition outcomes. And, um, and I think the other thing I want to think about, because this is what I, I, I think, in my ideal view of the world, this 34% uh, of non-purchased food would be something that we would all be talking about all the time. Basically, every food system in the world that, well, not everyone, but most of the ones we're interested in in this room, based on what I know, they're not pure subsistence. There are very few people who live, hardly anyone, off of all their own food. And they're not all global food system 100% market. They're in between. In this case, it took a long time, it's a big team, but it's 34% of non-purchased food, 34% local food. I think that really matters where your community or your household is on in this spectrum. We never really talk about it. It takes a little while to figure it out. But I think if you're interested in food, food sovereignty, food issues, knowing where, where that number is should be like basic information. And there are actually, I mean, I, I really think there should be a whole new wave of science which uses th this, um, this input as one of several, I think, to enable us to, to better locate our biodiversity and food research. It really, it's a huge difference if a community is 20% local food versus 80% local food. Why are we not talking about it? Why has it taken 20 years? For us, I mean, I've been doing this for more than 20 years. 20 years would be a nice low number, but but um, but that's just a, that's just a key indicator, and I think we should put it into our science as soon as possible. And I think that 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 my work on these systems is starting to to do that for several years now. Okay, so basically, if you remember the diagram, this is like how the input factors are influencing the nutrition and, and other outcomes. Well, we can also model it the other way. How do food choices, how do factor, other factors influence the biodiversity? So here, too, legumes are really, really important. Legume crop rotation turns out to be one of the main predictors of whether you have more biodiversity in these systems. Yes, it's nitrogen management. Yes, it reflects other kinds of household capacities. And um, I think that, that there, was, uh, there was at least one talk on this earlier in the day. And, and I think that's just really interesting and important. Another finding is that the more people eat traditional food, the more they eat self-produced food, the more likely they are to grow diverse food. To the best of my knowledge, this is the first time that we've ever looked at the food and nutrition outcome factors, quote unquote out outcome factors, as inputs into what are those influences on diversity in the system. And I just think that that should become, that should be a much tighter, closer, more practiced form of modeling and thinking and conceptualizing these systems. Foods have an influence in terms of what people grow. And again, I think it's, I, I don't have a, a really big point about this, but remember this is one-third local food. 
and yet you're seeing all of these interactions, all of these influences, which I think is a really interesting example for me of like how changes almost at the margins of a system. This is just one third local, and yet we're seeing influences in both directions. So just because people are, are consuming two thirds of their, or purchasing two thirds of the food, it's non-local, doesn't mean there isn't leverage, there's plenty of leverage here for both biodiversity and food outcomes. We shouldn't give up just because people are relying more than 50% on non-local food. So for me, that's another huge finding here, right? This is a really lot of space where we can and should be operating with a lot of new opportunities opening up. Okay, so that was the second part of my talk. Uh, I tried to, to highlight the, the role of the food legumes um, and uh, uh, what, what time do I have until again? Sorry. Eight minutes. So, um, yeah, this is the longest part of the talk, but I'll just try to shorten it a lot. So, so the, you know, we learn a lot from a pandemic, and the pandemic was especially intense in Peru. Peru suffered among the world's highest mortality rates. I think for a long time it was the single most highest mortality rate. The lockdowns, uh, the Sierra was like so stringent that people lost access to markets. So what happened, you know, this becomes a, 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 a really um, extreme, extreme event in terms of food systems because that, that two thirds of food that's typically production, uh, purchased rather, becomes eliminated. And so how people adjusted was, 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 really, was really important and they did, they adjusted through food processing, through the use of biodiversity. We, we next month in Peru, will be starting a, a series of, of publications and publicity about this because one of the ideas that I think many of you are probably interested in too, uh, how, do, how, do we, how do we learn the positive messages to the extent that they existed of the, of the pandemic, of the, of the main phase of the pandemic. And, and these were some really, truly uh, pretty extraordinary situations. So um, people's jobs were lost pretty much overnight. Some of them walked as much as 350 kilometers over the Andes Mountains back to these communities. That's real. I mean, I just talked to those people. No one was exaggerating. And, and they had to rely on local food. And they were relying on biodiverse food. They were relying on food that, um, that they could process locally. The knowledge systems of that uh, processing became essential. And so what I'm doing here, I'm gonna try to be really provocative again, is to say that they were very resilient, right? The, this work, it's funded, the grant, it centers on the concept of resilience. It's, a, it's kind of a, an amazing example of resilience, but the resilience was actually combined with a lot of vulnerability. So as a scientist, I think like part of my, uh, and working with these communities, my obligation is to try to figure out a way to tell these analyses in a narrative that combines the resilience with a lot of the vulnerability that coexisted. My hunch is a lot of us work in situations where we have to tell stories that combine resilience and vulnerability and that we can learn from one another about that. So, you know, they, 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 they talked about fermenting potatoes. I mean, that's a pretty amazing thing. That, that's, uh, that this area is known for fermented potatoes. If there was one of these fermented potatoes like 200 meters that way, we'd be able to smell it. So, <laughs> so it's a very intense food. It's intensely probiotic, um, and it involves lots of processing knowledge, and this became essential. And, and virtually all the foods uh, that enabled them to survive uh, had processing knowledge and capacities that were associated with them. But the bottom part of the slide is the other part of the story, that even as they were in many ways being resilient superheroes and, 
and you know we're working with a thousand pages of transcribed interviews about their superhero capacities, and that's important, and we need to save that because there will be more crises. But they were not superheroes in the sense of the overall picture, and they, they really did suffer uh, from many other things that were going on in terms of losing income, losing um, uh, fertilizer prices globally, as you probably know, have gone really high. Poor, poor people, marginal people are really affected by these. So again, I'm going to just make this long story short and say as scientists, many of us who work on food and biodiversity want, need to think about how to combine resilience and vulnerability in the, the analyses that we work on. I have a short section here on recipes. I hope I didn't, I might, yeah, here, step, start with this slide. This is work um, that I started last year doing this with Christiane, and this is basically a very like everyday way of thinking about food systems through the lens of, of recipes. Uh, this project has yielded a database of 1,200 recipes. So we've started to think about how, as scientists working on food and biodiversity, can we conceptualize and analyze recipes. And, and uh, basically, we have a conceptual model. We have our study landscape. And we have some initial results and a, a, a manuscript that, um, that is, is part of a part of this, and so this is this is this is recipe data. They're basically ingredient lists. I don't know if many of you have worked with nutritionists. I had never, uh, as a biodiversity scientist, I had never worked with nutritionists. But they're really interesting people to work with. And one of the things was to, uh, and and I will continue, is this kind of data associated with recipes, and we're doing. Uh, something I won't talk about is just the, the migrant part of this project, which is also really interesting. Like what happens in the same families comparing the rural space and the capital city space of Lima. So uh, let me just show a couple of result slides. I had a mentor in anthropology 15 or 20 years ago, I keep using that number, um, who told me, a recipe in a traditional society, by definition, is something that doesn't vary. That, that like, you know, uh, traditional people have a very, like, fixed idea of what a recipe is. And I'm not sure what led her to say that, but it was a good point, and I kind of accepted it and never really had a chance to check it. But wow, it's not true at all. Um, the, the numbers of ingredients, you know, recipes will have a few key ingredients, but then it varies. And when I showed this to, with my nutrition colleagues a couple months ago, they, they're really excited about this. Because this basically means, from the point of view of the food system and the nutrition system, if you want to add biodiversity to these diets, you don't need to, to, to invent new recipes. You don't need to give them new foods. You can work with existing recipes and existing foods and realize you have a lot of latitude and, and possibility to improve the diversity content of those foods. And I think Christiane and, and I will be emphasizing that point as we, as we go forward um, with, with this. Um, the, the, the spatial... The spatial data is, 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 is interesting, there, it's complex, there are some associations that, that occur, but in many ways, um, this recipe data do, is not, it's not structured. In other words, um, there, there aren't local dis, uh, differences within this particular region. Maybe they exist with other regions or whatever. But I'd get way down into the weeds if I started talking about this anymore. So I'm moving on. So um, last part of my talk, last three slides, they asked me to be integrative. And, and when I was here in Montpellier last year, I was here for 10 months uh, as a visiting scientist. And I worked 
with uh, collaborators on a very integrative idea. It goes beyond agronomy. It combines the social scientists, the combined social sciences, and it's called the concept of the plantation is seen. It has its own literature. It has its own scholarship. But I think for me, if I were to bring it to this audience, be provocative, try to keep you guys awake at the end of the day, basically what excites me about the plantation is seen and I hear it in our talks and our thinking, is the idea that we should be analyzing not just the diverse systems, but also analyze, analyzing the monocultures and the, 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 expanding, um, the expanding threats to diversity in the, in the form of uh, various types of industrial monocultures that we can't like that, that the picture increasingly in the world has both of those elements combined with one another. If you look at olives in Morocco, great talk, thank you very much. I mean, that those, those systems are so much part of the landscapes as, as many of you know. And so, so in this analysis, we look at the history of combined diverse systems and the very beginning of mono cropping in, in Spain, which became a colonial empire and extended that monocropping. And we look at, at Andalus, uh, what, what is uh, mainly southern Spain, and which was really kind of Castilian colonialism that in the 1500s was extended everywhere. Monocrops and plantations spread everywhere. But a lot of that was tested out when the Castilians conquered southern Spain. So we look at we look historically at the combination of the monocrops and the diverse crops. This is a little bit of a divergence, but I'm saying that this is a very integrated perspective in different forms. Maybe uh, your projects, my projects, can be looking at the combination of monocropping and diverse systems. So, like I say, we look at we look at the space of of the colonized area of southern Spain, recognizing that this was kind of the start of a big phase of the, plant, of the growth of plantations and the competition and conflicts between diversity and monoculture that has spread all around the world. And then also while I was here, I had a chance to do a project on current Western Mediterranean monocropping and agrobiodiversity interactions and competitions with colleagues in, in CEF that, that I was, was working with using this model of the, of the plantation as seen. Zero minutes, and there's my conclusion slide. So basically, I was asked to come here to talk about integrative approaches involving territories, I'm saying that we need to think about multi-scale and also multi-site territories. I think that, that many of our systems have those spatial properties and we can build those into what we do. I, I have new evidence on the crucial role of legumes. In my view, they are part of these coupled systems and we can and should start thinking about these positive feedbacks or synergies in which both production and consumption benefit uh, legume uh, benefit legumes, and legumes are have a key role in that. I'm suggesting that we think about autonomy in between pure subsistence, hardly ever exists anywhere to the best of my knowledge. 100% global food systems, almost all of our systems are in the middle. Took me a long, you know, my collaborators and I worked for a few years to get this data, but I, I think we should be developing rapid appraisal techniques, better locate our system, our food systems, and think about this as a key, potentially a key variable. Talked about the pandemic and recipes and the plantation is seen. I have a really lot of acknowledgements, many people to be thankful for, for opportunities to work together. Uh, on these projects, uh, several of which are, are continuing. So um, thank you.